Welcome to Ministry in Motion, where we explore best practices for your ministry in the 21st century. Whether you're a pastor or a volunteer leader in your local church, Ministry in Motion is for you. And we're delighted that you've joined us. I'm Anthony Kent, and we have a special program today. Today's program is Preparing Your Sermon. And our special guest is Pastor Randy Roberts, the Senior Pastor of the Loma Linda University Campus Church. Randy, thanks so much for joining us again on Ministry in Motion. Now, we want to get down to how you prepare Mm -hmm. a specific sermon. All right. Now, we know that you're a biblical preacher and you particularly enjoy preaching expository sermons. You can't do that unless you're reading your Bible. Mm, Very true. Now, how do you read your Bible with preaching in mind? Two ways, probably. The first way is something that we talked about a bit earlier in an earlier interview, but let me come back to it here for a moment, and that is reading throughout the year. I have made it over the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, my habit to read the Bible through every year. Early on, the way I did it was kind of like HMS Richard Sr. would do it in a very concentrated, focused period of time. So in the first two months of the year, I would take an hour a day and read. And in about 60 days, I was done reading through the Bible. And I would spend the rest of the year reading other aspects, maybe the New Testament or one of the Gospels or something like that. In more recent years, I've taken a much slower journey and have gone more slowly through the text. Uh, Maybe it's a number of chapters or a number of pages a day. At at times, I've even read something that has been preset where you're given certain readings for the day, a Bible reading plan through the year. But in whatever way I've done it, the purpose in that setting is not deep study. It's not taking a lot of notes. It's not slowing down. It's just to read for personal nourishment, for a view of the landscape, to get a sense of God's movement through the scriptural account. So that's one way. Mm -hmm. A second way is when it comes to actual preaching of a certain section of scripture. Let's say 1 John, which I'm working on now. I will take 1 John and read it slowly and reread it and reread it and begin to mark down key words and key themes and thoughts that come to me, questions that arise. Uh, What does this mean? Here's something that's really clear, but here's something that I really don't understand. Start taking note of all of those kinds of aspects of the text. And I will reread it typically over a period maybe of weeks or even months, just making that a very deep part of who I am. I strongly believe something I read some years ago in Leadership Journal. I couldn't even tell you who the author of this was, but it really stuck in my mind. And that is, I don't want to preach on a text until I have a strong grasp of what's in that text. Mm. In other words, Anthony, I don't want the experience of standing at the door shaking hands and somebody saying to me, but did you notice that? And I'm standing there thinking, I never even saw that. I don't want that experience. Mm. So a strong grasp of the text. But then secondly, I don't want to preach on it until the text has a strong grasp on me Mm. so that this has become a part of my life. So then reading slowly, reading deeply, reading over an extended period of time becomes very important. Exactly. So I I take it that your reading is very intentional. You're sitting at a desk (coughs) and you're actively taking notes as as you read. Do you have a particular translation that you normally Mm -hmm. gravitate towards? There is. I personally really like the today's New International Version, the TNIV. Right. Uh, There are other versions that are very helpful, very meaningful, and I respect that. It has just been a bit of a, I don't know if mid-range is the right word, but between a, a translation like the NASB which has really worked hard to be specific and as literal as possible in its portraying of the original language, but is not always the most readable. It's a little bit more choppy to read. Or maybe the NLT, New Living Translation, or even further out, a paraphrase, which can be wonderful for reading, but 
are not necessarily the best for careful study. Yeah. The TNIV to me kind of bridges those worlds and has been a very helpful translation. Mm, okay. Now, when, when you're reading the text, it's also helpful, as we all know, to, to look at other people's views mm -hmm. of the text as mm -hmm. well. Do you, what, what other authors do you, do you find yourself and what are you reading at the moment? Yes. This is probably not real exciting to most people, but I read a fair number of commentaries. I mean, mm -hmm. just sit down and read them all the way through. Right. Now, there are some commentaries that weren't written for that kind of reading. The SDA Bible Commentary, Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, which I use every time I prepare a sermon. I find mm -hmm. it immensely helpful. But it wasn't written to be read through. It's yeah. very clearly written for reference work. Now, the difference there might be in the introductory section to a book or something that's written in a way that you can read through. But I've often felt that the SDA Bible commentary is very good at the trees, but it's not great at the forest. Mm. If you want to get down to specifics in the text, you know, what was the Greek word here and what might Paul have meant here and so forth, I find it very helpful with that. I don't find it helpful for the broad view of mm. a book. So there's some others that have been helpful to me. For example, the Bible Made Plain series, John Stott was one of the one of the editors behind that, and also one of the authors. I'll read through those, the message of First Timothy or First John or the Gospel of John or whatever. That's one I'll read through. It helps give me a good bird's eye view of the whole, whole book. Mm -hmm. Doesn't get bogged down in the details of it, but it's very helpful. The NIV application commentary is similar in that way. Many times I've read through that. So I'll read often through a commentary in the preparatory process to preaching a series, get a good bird's eye view. Then when the week comes and I'm preaching on any given passage, I'll go to commentaries like the SDA Bible commentary that now sort out not the big picture, but the more specific details. Okay. Now, I assume you look from time to time at Ellen White's work? Yes, absolutely. In fact, that's a part of my daily devotions. I usually read three things daily. I read the Bible. Mm -hmm. I read Ellen White. Right now I'm reading through the Conflict of the Ages series, just finished Desire of Ages. And right now I'm in Acts of the Apostles. And then I'll read something else. And that can vary fairly widely. Sometimes it's something that's just spiritual nourishment for me. It has nothing to do with preaching or ministry. And sometimes it's something that's focused on ministry or preaching. Right, okay. So we've, we've, in this segment of the program, we've looked at the, the place of the Bible mm -hmm. and you, you brought a reading. Mm -hmm. I'd like to come back after the break and explore with you the place of prayer Excellent. In, in, in your preparation. Yes. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more of Ministry in Motion. <music> Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. Our topic today is preparing your sermon. And our special guest is Pastor Randy Roberts, the senior pastor of the Loma Linda University Campus Church. Now, Randy, before the break, we were looking at the, the vital place mm -hmm. of Bible study, broader reading, note taking and so forth right. in your sermon preparation. But I imagine that prayer has a, a, a vital component as well because God communicates with us through prayer, we communicate right. with Him. And there's, right. there's stuff that we need to know from God in our preaching. How do you integrate your prayer time mm -hmm. with your Bible study for sermon preparation? Well, I, th I think the key part of prayer in terms of sermon preparation is God make me a channel to say what you want to say to this community that is based on what you said in the past. In a sense, it's like John Stott said, that we affirm that what is written in Scripture is the Word of God, that through Scripture God speaks, and that it is through what He spoke that He now speaks. Mm. And so if we affirm that truth, that Scripture is alive and vibrant and continues to speak into the lives of both listeners and people of the world, it continues to do that, then our prayer becomes, Lord, help me to be a channel through which that communication can occur, through which what you want to say can be said. So uh, kind of, I have an image from years ago from a speaker who spoke about us being pipes through which the oil of the Holy Spirit flows. 
and that our prayer becomes, Lord, clean out these pipes mm. so there's not a lot of gunk in them, kind of like arthrosclerosis in the, in the veins, uh, inhibiting the flow. Clean them out, clean me out so that it can flow freely. So I think prayer comes in in that regard. Lord, make me a channel, make me a vessel, give me words. Uh, Jeremiah, it was God's words and his mouth that communicated the message. So please place your words in my mouth that they might hear what you would have said. And have you ever found yourself in a situation <laughs> where prayer has really trumped and you've, as a result of your prayer time, God has more or less changed your message. You've had to midweek changed what you were planning to, to preach on. You felt so strongly impressed. Or do you feel as though God has led you in the preparation process? Have you ever had to change your preaching as a result of your prayer time? I think what I have more commonly had to do, Anthony, is change me as a result of the text and the prayer. Have there been times when I've changed the preaching? Absolutely, that, mm -hmm. that does happen. But I think it has been more common for me that I have ended up having to address something in my own life, something in my own relationships, my wife, my kids, or somebody at the church, something like that. It has amazed me over the years how many times I have come to the preaching of a passage that is dealing with something specifically in my own life, anger or envy or lack of forgiveness or whatever the case might be, and where I have had to pray, God, please change my heart, change me first. And I have come to feel that enough that I sometimes will say, somebody said, will say to me, maybe you preach that sermon for me, and I'll say, Truth is, I was preaching to me, and if you wanted to eavesdrop, that was fine. <laughs> exactly. But that it, it ends up often calling on me to change, which isn't as easy. It's a confronting process, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Do you know, like, the, the Word of God and prayer, these things just confront us. Correct. And, and we can put a wall up, but we're damaged by that, aren't we? Right. And unless we, we do let God speak to us and His Word speak to us, particularly as preachers. Absolutely. Has to speak to us first, has to work on us first, if we expect it to work on the listener in the way we might desire. And I've often prayed, God, work on me as I work on the text, so that I might become what you want in the preparation and speaking of your Word. Yeah. Now, Randy, when, when you go to the text and you immerse yourself in the text, you immerse yourself in prayer time with that, do you have some typical questions that you normally ask of the, of the text to, yes. as you explore the, the text? What are some of those typical questions? Absolutely. Two key questions are what did it mean and what does it mean? So what did it mean when this occurred when it was written when the spirit inspired it what did it mean and then based on that foundation of what it meant what does it mean now to to me and to the listeners to whom i will preach and one of the key facets of that is a thought that comes from brian chapel who writes about preaching it's what he calls the the fallen condition focus the fcf fallen condition focus of the text and kind of based on my interaction with his writing, here's what it has meant to me. I believe that every section of Scripture, I'm not necessarily talking about every individual text and so forth, because sometimes the picture is much bigger than that, but that every section of Scripture, be it smaller or larger, was written to address some aspect of our fallen condition. Now, that might be a sinful aspect, it might be pride, it might be lust, it might be anger, or it might be something that is part of the human condition that is not sinful in itself, but is a result of the sinful condition. It might be loneliness, weariness, you know, something along those lines. But that every section of Scripture was written to address something about our fallen condition. Mm -hmm. So my question becomes, what is this addressing in the fallen condition of humanity? If I can understand that, that gives me an immediate bridge into the life of the listener. Because in that sense, 
though they may be separated by two or three thousand years, the original participants in that passage and the listeners in my pew are the same. If it's addressing pride, that fallen condition focus was the same in both of those hearts, and it will provide a link from the passage to the listener. And my next question is, now what does this text say to that fallen condition focus? Does it confront it? Does it challenge it? Does it call it to repentance? Does it offer assurance in the midst of it? What is it saying to that? So then I can speak to that and speak to it whatever scripture is saying to it. So those are key questions for me. What did it mean? What does it mean? What's the fallen condition focus? And what does it say to that fallen condition focus? You know, I'd love to pursue this more with you after the break, Randy. Mm -hmm. Particularly addressing that fallen condition focus, mm -hmm. how we present mm -hmm. that in a positive way mm -hmm. without being a confrontive, right. negative force. Right. Can we talk about that Absolutely. more? Absolutely. Okay. We'll be right back with more of Ministry in Motion. Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. Our topic today is preparing your sermon and our special guest is Pastor Randy Roberts, the senior pastor of the Loma Linda University Campus Church. Now, Randy, just before the break, we were talking about the fallen condition focus. Right. And how the, the pastor, the preacher, actually confronts mm. this, this topic mm -hmm. and presents it to the congregation. My question is, is how does the pastor do that? How does the preacher do that without setting up that atmosphere of confrontation and mm -hmm. animosity, without the congregation thinking, this guy's beating me up? Right. How, how right. do we avoid that so that we can present it in, well, there are times where it needs to be confronting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we can't do it every worship service. Sure. A number of things come to mind for me in that. I think that's a a very important issue in question. One of the first things that jumps to mind is I love Ellen White's focus on and, and commentary about how Jesus did that in his ministry. Desire of Ages, she says, when he uttered his scathing rebukes, tears were in his voice. Wow. And so there was this sense that something needed to be said. And make no mistake about it, that came time and again to the religious leaders, not to the sinners, mm -hmm. or what were called the sinners in the day. It, he confronted much more commonly the religious leadership. But even in that sense, there, there were tears streaking his cheeks. There was a, a clear pain in his own heart about it. And it has led me to this conclusion about church discipline generally. If you enjoy church discipline, you're the last person to be doing it. Yeah. Nobody who enjoys it should be doing it. And so there is something about one's own broken heart and soul first, a recognition of one's own brokenness and sinfulness, having the text speak to me first, have it correct me, challenge me, convict me. If that has legitimately happened, then anything I might need to say by way of correcting the congregation is going to come out of that veil of tears in my own life and will be in a spirit of Jesus. So that's the first thing I think is really important. The second thing is relationship is key. Mm. It, is, it underlies everything that might go on in terms of correction. I'm using an example from another world that I've been blessed to be a part of, and that's the world of family counseling, marriage and family therapy. If I have a couple come in to see me and they're in a blended family, one of them is a biological parent and the other is not of the kids that they have, especially early on in that marriage, I would say to the person who is the step parent, you need be doing no discipline at this point in time. That is not your role. Mm. The only reason discipline works with children is because children are convinced that that parent loves them. Mm when they are absolutely, utterly convinced that the parent loves them, discipline works. If they're not convinced of that, then discipline simply becomes cruelty. Mm -hmm. Now, translate that to the congregation. I think it is the same thing that is true. If a congregation sits here and looks up at that preacher and says about him or about her, 
I don't really care about me. Mm -hmm. Then whatever is doled out by way of correction will typically be resisted. It's like, what, what are you saying? You, don't even, you know, I don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. If they look up at that preacher and say, she loves me, he loves me. They've walked with me through my grief. They've been at my weddings. They, there is a relationship there of depth. And then you say it from that right spirit that grows out of you. It will be heard. It will be accepted in a way that nothing else can replace. Mm. That's why I think those who stand out on the street corner yelling repent do so much damage to the cause of Christ. There's no relationship there that gives any permission to call someone to account in that fashion. And that's the unique power and privilege of the local church pastor. We have the privilege of being in and a part of these people's lives and therefore having the permission to speak something into their lives that may be hard to hear. Mm. So I think that's really important, that relational element. And you know, you, you analogy there be, between being a biological right. relative right. and in a sense in the church community, a, a, a pastor that's functioning well is a biological yes, relative of, of that community and he's empowered to do that. Correct. So just in practical ways, Randy, how would you suggest that a, a pastor can demonstrate clearly their love for the, that congregation? A lot of it comes through presence and relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, when you relate to the members of your congregation, you, you at the potlucks, you're at the social events, you're at the funerals, at the weddings, you're, you're a part of that, you're supportive of them, you're caring about them, nothing replaces that. Secondly, if there is a steady diet from the pulpit of biblical preaching that communicates the love of God mm. and communicate how, communicates how the love and the grace of God not only forgive us but transform us so that people walk out of church feeling hope for the next week, then when those times come when you do have to speak to it, people will be able to listen and to hear it. To any young minister, I would say, choose your battles wisely. Yeah. Choose those moments when you have to call people to account carefully. Because the other times you're putting money in the bank, those times you're withdrawing. And if you have made insufficient deposits, and now you're making this huge withdrawal, you could be in trouble. And so the steady diet that builds up, encourages, is so important against the backdrop of the time when you have to be more, to use the term used earlier, confrontive. Yeah, yeah. These are very helpful insights, Randy, born from experience. <laughs> and um, yeah, many years of experience preaching and, and leading God's people. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming on Ministry in Motion. It's a privilege. We really appreciate your insights. Absolutely. Thank you. And we want to thank you for joining us for yet another Ministry in Motion program. You're welcome to visit us at our website, ministryinmotion.tv. There, there is a vast array of resources. And if you're a pastor and you're not receiving Ministry magazine, write to us at the contact section of ministryinmotion.tv. Tell us about your ministry and you may be eligible for a complimentary subscription to Ministry magazine. But until next time, May God bless you richly.